So for this topic of plant paleoecology, I'm going to take advantage of slides that Dr. Lori Collins showed when she talked to our plant ecology class, a previous offering. In this lecture, you're going to learn that plants have changed the climate of the earth over time, and also that they are so important because they're the main tool for telling us how climate changed during the Ice Age. So geology majors may know this by heart, but for us biologists, it always helps to look at the chart of the geological time scale. The numbers stand for millions of years from the Precambrian, more than 500 million years ago, through the Paleozoic and Mesozoic to the Cenozoic era, which is the most recent and the Holocene, what happened before today, some people say we live today in the Homogocene, everything's becoming the same. Plants arose sometime in, in the Paleozoic era, and that's what we'll talk about today. So the first plants appeared in the Ordovician after the Cambrian when life began, or maybe the pre-Cambrian times. Those first plants were non-vascular plants, mosses and symbiotic lichens who could live in tough places. It was during the Silurian that the first vascular plants arose, and that's the time that arthropods, the group which includes the insects, arose. In the Devonian, vertebrates arose, and it wasn't till a lot later in time, in the Cretaceous period, that the first flowering plants fossils have been found. So here's an example of a non-vascular plant, a bryophyte, specifically a liverwort, named for its thallus, the, the thallus, the body that looks kind of in the shape of liver. And these reproductive structures hold the Antheridia and Archegonia. So you probably know that the non-vascular plants include the protists, the, the green algae, and from those descended the non-vascular plants, mosses and their relatives, and then the... <coughs> The vascular plants, which include the ferns and their relatives, and then seed-bearing plants, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. So here are some early spore-bearing vascular plants, the rhinia, um, found in the so-called rhiny chert, geological deposits in the British Isles and other places, hailing from the early Devonian era. And one of the very earliest ones was found in the early Silurian, and this is about two and a half centimeters or an inch in diameter. So imagine what it was like in those pre-Devonian times. There was no vegetation at all in the areas outside of the water, and what that meant was the soils were not stabilized by any plant roots, so the landscape changed. And when plants came, they stabilized the situation. So the earliest plants were on the edges of water because they had come from ancestors that lived in the water. Archaeopteris was the earliest tree-like plant and it came about in the late Devonian and had things that we really would consider leaves. So you can see it was pretty tall. Archaeopteris doesn't exist anymore. We know it only as a fossil, just as Rhinia, which you saw before. So some fossils were found that allowed archaeologists to reconstruct the ancestor to the seed plant and 
These seed plants arose near the end of the Devonian period. By developing seeds, plants were able to move away from water because they no longer needed water for fertilization. You can see on the right actual fossilized seeds from the seed ferns, the oldest known seed plants. What was interesting is that once these plants started to dominate over the land, they consumed a lot of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And so greenhouse warming slowed, things cooled, and a lot of species on Earth died at that time in mass extinctions. In this picture, we can see tree ferns, spore-bearing trees, and seed ferns, also a giant cockroach and a dragonfly. And this is a picture of what it was like in the late Carboniferous, the Pennsylvanian era, when these spore-bearing trees grew abundantly in swampy areas, died, and then their bodies were compressed over millions of years to form coal and other fossil fuels. So these trees, spore-bearing trees, were part of the lycopods that a group of plants related to ferns, not having seeds but spores. And if you look at the close-up of the fossils of the trunks, you can see the leaf scars. And to the right here are some roots of lycopods in rock in Scotland. This diagram shows the, how the diversity of different groups of plants expanded and then contracted over geological time from the earliest time at the bottom till the present day at the top. So you can see the spore-bearing plants in the Carboniferous quite abundant, but then as time progressed, new groups of plants came into being. First, the conifers, cycads and conifers. And these uh, were more successful and spread farther and were um, outcompeted, presumably, a lot of the lycopods and other spore-bearing plants. And then later in the Cretaceous, when angiosperms or flowering plants arose, you can see that gymnosperm diversity or dominance declined, the cycads and conifers, as flowering plants became more diverse. So one of the points people still discuss a lot and argue about is why gymnosperms took over the landscape in the Mesozoic. I mentioned that maybe they're more successful because their seeds allowed them to live in lots more habitats. But people have different opinions about this. In this picture, we see a single landmass, Pangaea, which is what the Earth was like before continental drift made the different continents. As the continents moved and dried, there was less carbon buried in the swamps and so more carbon was released to the atmosphere due to oxidation by small heterotrophs. And with greater carbon dioxide, the atmosphere warmed, greenhouse warming. So the Ice Age is considered from three million years ago to the present time, during which time ice has been receding, the last Glacial maximum, which is shown here, the extent of the white, lighter color, was 20,000 years ago.
So you can imagine as this white ice sheet melts, the vegetation can creep up following it. And as the climate warms, plants migrate, especially if there aren't human developments in the way. So the changes in climate were felt around the world and temperature gradients increased. Things dried out in many places, except for in the Great Basin in the western part of the U.S. This was an unusual area because there were mountains all around it, and they deflected some of the air currents, and this gave rise to the Great Salt Lake. So even though you can reconstruct vegetation from pollen, the best way to reconstruct the timing of the temperature changes, Dr. Laurie Collins says, is with stable isotopes of oxygen from deep sea microfossils. And so this is what these diagrams show. But I'll end this with a picture, an artist's conception of what Florida would have looked like two and a half million years ago, which had the greatest diversity in the United States, a variety of vertebrates, as well as plants, gymnosperms and angiosperms in this picture.